Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Burns. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be back in Georgia. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, David. Uh, it's really special to be back talking at the Georgia State Conference. I, I didn't remember when it was, but it was in 1991, and that's when C.D. and Ida Collins uh, were here. And I think it was in Columbus. Uh, the years have been kind since that time, but those memories are very fond. Georgia holds a very special place for me. Uh, I got I went to treatment here in 1977. My birthday is December the 1st of 1977. And my son went into treatment in Georgia in 1984. My daughter uh, was introduced to the family disease of alcoholism in 1987, uh, 1997. And she came into AA in 19, uh, 1977, 1979. And Libby's been in AA for 29 years, and Burns has been in AA for 24 or 25 years. They're not speaking to me right now, but they're sober, and that's good enough, you know? <laughs> I can't wait for them to grow up so I'll quit being the idiot that they think I am, so whatever it may be. Uh, I was always told that uh, when you're getting, and also I want to say one other thing, I have been uh, traveling a lot of my sobriety and been privileged to talk to a lot of groups, and I mean this with all sincerity, I don't know that I've ever been a part of a stronger panel of speakers uh, now, I will not tell you I've heard them all, but I've heard the ones who've been talking for any period of time uh, many times before, either really or within on tapes. This is an incredible, an incredibly strong group of speakers, and uh, and I really am grateful to be chosen to be a part of that panel. I was told a long time ago that if you were a little nervous when you got up to talk, and I don't know that I'm really nervous, but I do get fired up, and I was told, just imagine everybody in the audience is naked. And when I was a young speaker and was more full of fear, I used to imagine that, and it would amuse me. Now I imagine it, and it's really neat, i got to tell you. It's, it's really fun. Uh, I was a little worried. Some of you guys are looking better than you used to, so that's the guy me just a little bit. When I first got here, uh, a, a really handsome young man came over to me, and he said, I first heard you in Huntsville. I think it was the middle 90s. And he said, uh, I was there with my girlfriend at that time and said, we were, this, we were both very new in AA. We'd never even been to a conference. And said, her sponsor was shielding her from me, and my sponsor was shielding her from me. And he says, my test, well, he didn't say test on, he said, I wanted more than anything on earth to have a relationship with her. And said, we couldn't get together. And said, it, said, I don't know how it was bothering her, but said, it was really driving me crazy. He said, I just, said, we wanted to stay sober. Our sponsors told us what to do. We knew we had to do it. And we, we really wanted to stay sober. He said, it was really driving me crazy. And said, we came down to hear you talk. And said it, it just turned our lives around. Said at that time we knew we could wait. We knew that we could enjoy sobriety and enjoy each other. And they got married and they've got two beautiful children. Introduced me to his wife. And I understood why he really was out there taking cold showers because she's a beautiful young lady. So I got to thinking about that, about the, 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 the glory of this program and the infallibility of this program when people really want to stay sober. Then I got to thinking about it, and I said, you know, my talks have pissed people off. They've inspired people. They've done a lot of things, but I don't know if anybody ever told me they were a method of birth control. So I guess that's what it is. <laughs> I will tell you, I know they put people to sleep sometimes, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, how to deal with your libido, listen to a tape by Burns Brady. Uh, the, uh, you've asked me to come tell you, and, and I really want to congratulate that couple because it is a neat story. They did just what I did. As Dick says, I was quiet 
because I wanted to be sober more than anything that I knew. It meant everything in the world to me, and I did what I was told. The first two years of my sobriety is unquestionably the most humble I've ever been in my life, without even trying except to follow the bouncing ball. And that's a lot of what this story is about. The thing I learned from my first sponsor, and there are many things I learned, and a lot of things weren't particularly positive. But the one thing I've known consistently that I learned from him in those ten, first ten years was obedience. Because I knew I knew nothing. Alcohol had whipped me so bad. It's what my Papa Brady used to call in small town in western Kentucky an ass whipping. I used to go out on this little 40-acre farm that Papa had in the late 30s and early 40s. Had it long before that. My daddy and all of his brothers and sisters were raised on that farm. And he would ride a one furrow plow behind an old mule. The mule was lightning. And I would run along beside him. I was about five years old, and I'd pick up a clod and bust old lightning in the butt. He'd kick back at Papa. Papa would say, Burns Mac, don't do that. And then I'd hit him with another clod, and he'd kick back at Papa and say, Burns Mac, don't do that. Finally hit that old mule, and he kicked at Papa, and he stopped that mule, went over and got him a little switch. He came back and just switched the hell out of my legs. I said, Papa, what's that? And he said, Burns Mac, that's an ass whipping. And if you don't want another one, don't hit that mule in the ass with another clod. Well, that's what alcohol did to me. I got to tell you, I've learned from so many people, you got to do what you got to do to maintain it. But I got here literally on my hands and knees with an incredibly powerful, all the way to the bone, ass whipping. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Is that ass whipping and the way back? As I go through this story, you'll hear a lot about the big book. I'm not a big book lawyer. I don't try to interpret most of the time. I don't try to interpret and I don't try to find loopholes, but I am a big book thumper. And the re- <laughs> the reason I am is the experience that I've had. When I first came in the program in Louisville, and this was not the same place Dick was, we went to different meetings, and we ran with different people. We knew each other, but we didn't run with the same people. And the people that I ran with, the sponsor I had, the marching orders were don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor, tell him what's wrong with you, he'll tell you what to do, and then go save a drunk. We never read the book, and we never did the steps, except just in passing. My first fourth step was four years in sobriety when I, he made up 300 questions and gave them to me, and my fifth step was when I answered the questions that he wrote out. But I was completely committed to that man in meetings, and I went to them with absolute religious commitment and fervor. And at 10 years in the program, I did some of the most incredibly self-centered, destructive, self-destructive, marriage-destructive things that you can do. And I will talk about that because I didn't have a design for living. I did not have a design for living. I had a three-step program that I crawled in here on, and I lived on that for 10 years. And subsequently, it was led to a 12-step program, so my story in many ways will differentiate for you what it's like to live 12 steps and what it's like to live three steps. And I can tell you from my experience, it's daylight and dark. I remember it at 11 years when I, was, when I saw the whole program open, and I said to God, I said, you know, I love you, and I know you loved me. Why don't you leave my ass out here for 10 years? I said, you could have come along and done something, because I was a willing, willing pupil. And I felt his voice say, like we do sometimes, you may impress a lot of people with what you know, but you'll help heal a lot of people with your experience. Never let anybody else get drunk around you out of ignorance. Never let anybody else get drunk around you out of ignorance. You can't get them sober and you can't get them drunk, but don't let them get drunk out of ignorance. And from that time on, I have dedicated myself to trying to live to outline in that book and to share that with the people who want to walk the walk with me and share with me what that had been in my life. 
I grew up in a little town in western Kentucky named Mayfield. I grew up in a home where there was no alcohol or no drugs. My mother's daddy died drinking bleach in the Mayfield City Jail in 1934. He was the town drunk. My mother was molested physically, emotionally, and sexually in that home. She was what we know today as an adult child of an alcoholic. If you have a problem with that term, just read the first page of the chapter of the family afterward. If you're around us, in essence, you get neurotic. Now, my mother was one of the finest women I've ever known. She had a heart as big as all outdoors. She absolutely loved me beyond measure, and I loved her the same. Look, she died in 78. I've missed her every day since then. Loved her when she was here. Love her when she's gone. But my mother was goofy. There was no other expression about it. My mother was goofy. Why shouldn't she have been goofy? She was racked with waves of resentment, fear, anger, confusion, all the things that constitute the family problem of alcoholism, and that came into our home. My daddy had two brothers who died of alcoholism, and mother and daddy committed their home to an alcohol and drug-free home and a loving home, but it was domineered and run by an adult child of an alcoholic or someone who had not dealt with their disease of alcoholism. From my mother, I learned, was first exposed to conditional love. And we've heard that mentioned from the podium. My mother's way back in Mayfield as the daughter of the town drunk was through me and subsequently my eight-year younger brother. I found out quickly that when I was perfect, my mother patted my ass, parted my hair, and made me king baby. And I loved it, but it was the first place I learned the best way to get approval is just sing and dance and be perfect. The second best thing that Bill Wilson ever wrote for me The best thing that he ever wrote for me, at least so far in my recovery, has been the big book or the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous. The second best thing that rings my bell was a letter he wrote in 1953 called Emotional Sobriety. And in that letter, he basically said that every one of his problems came from the need for approval. The need for approval. If you study Bill Wilson, you'll understand why he needed, craved that approval. Well, certainly I did. And I got it from my mama when I did exactly what my mama wanted me to do. She didn't want me to do anything bad. She just wanted me to be perfect. When I went to Sunday school, I was perfect. When I went to school, I was perfect. I got a B when I was in the third grade, and Mother didn't speak to me for six weeks. When I got my A's back, Mother spoke to me, and we were fine. She didn't fuss at me. She just didn't speak to me. So I never had another B in 12 years of going to high school. And in middle school. I mean, hell, if you'd looked at my resume at that time, you'd have thought one day I might be Pope, and I'm not even Catholic. I mean, I was a perfect kid, and I was perfect for the approval that I, I've held men in my lap big enough to eat this wall while they finished a fifth step, and they were sitting there crying because they were waiting for me to say, You piece of crap. And what I said was, We can get through this. We've got the God of our understanding, and all these people, and you're going to be okay. And they just sobbed because for the first time, some significant male said, you're okay. The second place I learned about conditional love was in the church. Now, if you think I got a problem with the church, oh, no, 12 years, I never missed Sunday school in church. Thank God. Because when I had a 12-gauge shotgun in my mouth in 1977, if it hadn't been for the values I learned in the church and from my home, as Sharon said, you'd have another speaker. There is no question about that. And when I came back from treatment, my best friend was my next-door neighbor, an Episcopal priest. We drank beer together and played golf together. I got sick, and he didn't. And when we came back, I held Jimmy's hands, and I said, take me back to my church. He said, I can do that, Burns, but you've got to go to AA. They have better success with alcoholics than we do. Now, I'd spent four months in treatment, so I knew that. But here's my best friend with a collar on telling me, yeah, I can take you back to church, but you got to go to AA. Now, I would have done that anyway, but this, this affidavit that he gave me, this affirmation he gave me was significant. So eight and a half years, I administered the chalice and the host and was a lay reader in the Episcopal Church. My wife and I ran the youth department. We sang in the, in the choir. We did all of those things. And like I am typically prone to do at eight and a half years in sobriety, going to five meetings a week, I was trying to play six feet six, and I'm only five feet nine. 
I was everything everywhere. On the vestry. If the church was having it, I was leading it. If AA was doing it, I was there doing something, whatever my sponsor told me to do. And my wife and I and my sponsor sat down with the priest and we, dis- we discussed what my, <clears throat> what my ministry would be. Now, we call it service, but any way you cut it, at least in my eyes, it's a ministry. And I said, if you want me to go, if you want me to go to, to seminary, I'll go. God, I'd rather have an ice water enema or a root canal, but I'll go <laughs> to the seminary if that's what you want me to do. And they said, no, you're, you belong in AA. You have a special service in AA. And I breathed a sigh of relief and I moved away from the church and all of that. Now I go to church still regularly, but I'm not in that profile position. And I love my church. And I love my Alcoholics Anonymous. And they both have brought stuff to me. There's no question about that. But in church was the second place that I learned about conditional love. And it wasn't what I thought they said. It's what they said. You believe this or you go to hell. You believe this or you go to hell. Now, I didn't have a real problem believing this, which was that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I didn't really have a big problem with that, but I had a real problem with sin. Now, I don't mean I had a problem questioning it. I had a problem because I was doing it. I was 12 years old, 12 years old. And they were teaching me in Sunday school, it's better to spill your seeds in the belly of a whore than on the ground. Now, at 12 years of age, I've just found me a new pull toy, and I'm having a real conflict of interest about this shit, about spilling my seeds in the belly of a whore. Now, hey folks, this ain't cheap humor. I'm telling you the truth. Because I would do... (laughs) I would do what 12-year-old little boys do five days out of the week. Then I'd quit on Saturday and go up and confess on Sunday and got baptized every Sunday night for damn near 12 years. I mean, that's just the way it was. I'm glad I got over that. <laughs> anyway, anyway. But that's where I learned about conditional love. So I'm having the two major inputs in my life of conditional love. This was forming my thinking. It did not make me an alcoholic. But I'll tell you what it did do. It formed the foundation that I would have to deal with to deal with all of the stuff that constitutes alcoholism in Burns Brady. I was taught very early when I came in the program, you stop the drinking and you don't deal with the thinking, you go back to the drinking. When I became a student and then a doer of the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, I found that Wilson called this the peculiar mental twist. He calls it the sideways thinking that allows me to get back to the drinking. Then he even taught me that (laughs) this is what's fascinating to me because in that book, he basically describes that we're bodily and mentally different. If I'm a real alcoholic, and God knows I got the criteria and credentials to do that, that I'm bodily and mentally different. And the textbook of AA, which is the best, the first and most complete scientific manual on the disease that we've ever had. It took us until the 90s to begin to put names to the things that he and Silkworth talked about. But they said that young people would drink differently from old people. They just, they just reported what they saw. That women would be severely affected physically much quicker and much more severely than men. All the things that we've later proved happen and we even know why they happen. He proved, he said that the alcoholic is irritable, restless, and discontented and drinks for the the effect. Now, today what we call irritable, restless, discontented is anxiety, depression, mood disorders, ADD, ADHD, bipolar 2. Hell, we've got to call it something because we're doctors, for God's sakes. We've got to give it a name. But Silkworth spelled it out in black and white. They're irritable, restless, and discontented until they drink for the effect. He first called it an allergy. We know that it's not an allergy, but it was a brilliant diagnosis because it was an abnormal reaction to alcohol, just like penicillin or hay fever or bee sting. But today we know what is wrong is we're born to court low. You have to decide if you're a real alcoholic, but if you're a real alcoholic, you're a quart low. 
Yeah, really. I mean, I, I, I practiced family medicine for 25 years. But in 1987, I started practicing addiction medicine, still do. Run an impaired physician program, working in the prisons, do it, setting up big book studies, all that kind of stuff since about 1992. And we're a quart low. We're a quart low because we are deficient in certain chemicals that are there because we didn't inherit them. So we run around in a world where most people hear, uh, all I ever heard was, ah! just like that. <laughs> I mean, hell, somebody honks, it, the, the, light, the, grit, the light is red and it turns green and somebody honks. And I spend at least 15 minutes arguing, wanting to fight, giving them the finger, or I spend the next three weeks driving around thinking, what a wuss I was. I didn't even say shit. I just drove up. And I deal with it today just like I dealt with it 35 years ago. It's the same thing. I have a crisis of identity at every green light, you know. (laughs) So I'm bodily different. I'm looking for relief. And I take a drink or I take a drug. And, man, I found it. Read Jim's story. It is magnificent. Jim failed. says he was okay except for a nervous disposition. That's irritable, restless, discontented. And he was fine, except he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And he says, let's talk about his thinking. I'm getting there, and I'm ready the first time I read it. I said, it's going to be profound. Good old Jim just would eat up with self-centeredness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Where in the hell did we hear that before? Self-centeredness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. So he screwed over people. The only thing we don't know about Jim is his sex conduct. So we don't know if he was up or down. But we know one way or another he wasn't able to work. It just didn't work. I mean, the whole clue just evaded me. And here it is in black and white. You want this design for living, Burns? Here's what's wrong with you. And here's the solution. I'm bodily and mentally different. Bodily and mentally different. I'm a court low, and it requires a spiritual solution. Alcohol and drugs were no problem for me in high school and college. Every now and then I'd drink too much beer and I'd do something weird, but it wasn't that often, it wasn't that weird, and just a little different. I started medical school in 1958 at the University of Lowell School of Medicine. I'm a card carrying, commode hugging, 12 gauge shotgun in the mouth, two quarts of whiskey, and I'd alcoholic. But part of my story has to do with drugs. And the unique part of this story is I took one drug for 12 years without drinking, and it nearly destroyed me. Then I drank for eight years with no other drug, including that drug, and it nearly destroyed me. I have an experience to share that there's no question in in my mind that every alcoholic needs to hear. Now, I absolutely revere the traditions and the singleness of purpose. Do not feel that this invades them in any way. If it does and you're offended, please accept the heart and the soul of why I'm telling this. Because I started taking amphetamine my freshman year in medical school. I didn't take it to get high. I'd never heard of it. But I was really shook up at my first gross anatomy exam and one of the upperclassmen came down and said, take this pill. It'll help you stay awake and study. I took that pill and that noise went away. I never knew that noise existed until I took that first pill and there was no more noise. I was focused. I was on point. I didn't feel fear. I didn't feel cocky. I was just focused. And the first semester of my freshman year, I was number one in my class. The second semester, I was number 100 in a class of 100. I quit taking the amphetamine that summer, got married, went back into medical school my sophomore year, started taking it again to study, never stopped. I got kicked out of medical school two weeks before graduation my senior year in 1962. In an amphetamine rage, I slapped one of my professors. They took me down to the department, the head of the department of psychiatry, along with the dean of the medical school. They sat me down. They said, Burns, what's wrong with you? And I said, I take too many drugs. And they said, do you believe that? And I said, yes, sir, I do. They said, we can help you. And I said, what are you going to do? We're going to put you in intensive psychiatric therapy. 
So for two years, I went to see a psychiatrist in Nashville. I saw a psychiatrist in Louisville, saw them once a week. Never took any drugs. I didn't drink. I was right back on top of my game. It took me about four or five months to get my concentration focused and whatnot that the drug had done to me. And I would sit there. I had to learn to study without drug, without a drug in me. And I started with sitting five minutes and reading my textbook until I got to where I could sit four or five and six hours. When I walked back into medical school, I was ready to go, felt great, and was on top of it. Walked in the hospital, and in less than an hour, I strung out on amphetamine again. I just sat on, I sat on the steps of the school and cried, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Now, you know, in essence, why I relapsed, but even then, I didn't know what was wrong. You brought me what was wrong. Psychiatry brought me knowledge. I'm not anti-psychiatry, and neither is this program. You read our material and see what it says. I'm anti-ignorance. And I've spent most of my sobriety, certainly after the first five years, trying to educate doctors from coast to coast and border to border. I've been dedicated to the education of doctors and to the recovery of doctors because they hurt us and we don't trust them. And between that arrangement, all kinds of chaos occurs. I think we're doing a better job in AA getting you to trust doctors because more of us know what we're doing today. But nevertheless, it has been effective. But I'm not anti-psychiatry, and neither is this program. I had excellent psychiatrists. At that time, they thought the treatment for alcoholism was the mental health model. Remember, this was in the 60s. This was still a pretty dark time in our background. Uh, <clears throat> cocaine taught us a lot. You know, alcohol is subtle. Alcohol, the analogy I use, here comes alcohol dribbling down the floor, goes up and lays the basketball on the backboard. It comes through the net and it's two points and everybody just kind of claps. Here comes cocaine walking in the other end of the court, naked, basketball in both hands, looking at the crowd and giving them four-letter words, dribbling down the floor, goes up, slaps in both basketballs, the net rips off, the backboard rips off, gives everybody the finger and goes out the back door, still two points. <laughs> so everything about cocaine was accelerated, and it taught us so much about cueing, euphoric recall, same place that we get PTSD. We learned all of that from cocaine. We didn't even know alcohol would do that. But I didn't, and we didn't know cocaine would do it for a number of years. But when I walked in that medical school, everything around me, you know, we say change playmates, playpens, and playthings. I walked right back in to the whole vat with no spiritual program. We can go anywhere if we're in fit spiritual condition, but we can't go anywhere if we're not. That even remotely is, requires more concentration than filling up my gas tank because we just don't have the tools and we're loaded. My classmates enabled me. Uh, they took me home when I'd get too hot. I was married and had one small child, and they put me to bed, and I'd cool off and come back, and I graduated. Entered my internship and residency, and I was taken out of that four times, mental hospital, strapped down, IV fluids, straight jackets, just get crazier than a goat. Uh, then I finally finished my residency and I started my private practice. Still on amphetamine. I was really pissed off at the Vietnam War. Vietnam War was raging and I was saying, win it or get out. I mean, I was just vehement. And I was in the doctor's lounge one day carrying on like that and one of the guys who was my friend, he really was, said, damn it, Burns, if you don't like it, join. I thought, by God, that's a good idea. <laughs> So I went out and got in the car and drove to Frankfurt and joined the Army. Didn't call my office, didn't call my wife, didn't call anybody. Just joined the Army. <laughs> went off to defend our country. Uh, after about, I had access to all the amphetamine. I was in charge of the dispensary. And after about six months to a year, the post commander came down and said, Burns, are you taking that amphetamine? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, if you don't quit, we're going to have to court martial you. So I quit once he explained it to me. <laughs> I quit. Now, part of the, in my drugging years, still no drinking. In my drugging years, if you made the consequences bad enough, I could quit. Now, there came a time in my drinking where the consequences didn't matter. I couldn't quit. 
then reached the point where I wasn't even going to try to quit. And that's just the way that it was. Stayed off of amphetamine for that uh, year, came home, got right back on it, started my practice, had a gallbladder attack. Surgeon, who was a good friend of mine then, is today, took my gallbladder out. The internist, who was a good friend of mine, still is today. We sat in that hospital and held hands and prayed that I would not take any more amphetamine. And that was my last one, 1969, because then I started drinking. Then I started drinking. This story is really important to me because more than ever today, we're seeing people who want to do marijuana maintenance. We're seeing, we're seeing, at least I'm seeing them, and I've dealt with thousands of prisoners, thousands of doctors, thousands of street people, and thousands of regular AA people. And more and more we're seeing people who want to get off of cocaine by drinking alcohol. Or they want to get off of marijuana by drinking alcohol. Whatever they may do. If you're an alcoholic of my type, None of this stuff is going to work in your brain like it does in normal people. And if you walk out of here tonight and say that Burns Brady says you shouldn't have pain medicine, you're wrong. I will tell you two stories to show you why it doesn't work in my brain and what happened. In 1994, I had my first heart attack. It was a big one. I almost died in the emergency room. They put the magic medicine in, dissolved the clot. That created two bouts of my heart just quivering with V-fib. They hit me with the shockers. First time I was already passed out, the second time I was awake. And by God, you want a spiritual experience, let them put some of them friars right on your door. <laughs> now, I'm here to tell you, I was full of enough morphine, I thought it was an existential experience. I thought, well, wow, well, how about that shit? You know, I mean, I mean, that's just the way it was. But I tell you what, I had to quit watching ER. <laughs> when they roll in those heart attacks, I start sweating. Yes, sir, Reed. Now, if I was handling a heart attack, that was different. But they rolled one in, uh-uh, in there, in, in the TV. It, it was a big deal. While I was there, I almost died uh, from that episode. They put me on IV Ativan, which is Turbo Valium. I wouldn't give you two hoots in hell for every Valium that had ever been made. I was on it IV for eight days, and then they sent me home, gave my wife pills to taper me, and everybody was cool. I got home. The second day, I went into a blackout. And we're sitting in the bedroom, and I walk over and pick up her purse, reach in, get them all out, and take them. I see her mouth moving, but I don't know what she's saying. <laughs> what she's saying is, what the hell are you doing? And I looked at her, and she said, what I said was, this stuff is screwing me up, and when I get it all taken, I won't have to take anymore. <laughs> then the next thing I remember, I looked at her, and I said, this will wear off in the morning. I'll have to go write a prescription to get some more. Now, we had brought in the addiction psychiatrist, so he was on the front end of this deal. And when I told the doctor, the cardiologist, I said, this is going to screw me up, so Charlie Frankie's coming in going to work with me. And he said, why? And I said, it's going to screw me up. And he said, then I won't give it to you. And I said, would you give it to anybody else? He said, yeah. And I said, then you damn well give it to me because I don't know what's going on. You're taking care of me. You take care of me. He'll clean me up when I get out of here. We called Charlie that night. They put me in the mental hospital, detoxed me over a seven-day bone-rattling detox. I went home fine. Everything went cool until about six, oh, about three years ago. I almost died for the second time. I went in the hospital to have a piece of colon taken out for a recurrent infection, and they did it through a little scope, and everything went cool. After it's over, we're all hugging each other and congratulating each other, and I flipped a whole bunch of blood clots in my lungs. That nearly killed me, and so I'm sitting in there for almost a month, and then I had a small heart attack. Then they said, well, you're over that. We'll send you home after this was two months. I had pneumonia and all that resistant infection stuff. So they sent me home, and the first night I was home, I had a massive heart attack. Went back in, and I stayed another month, and they were giving me the second time around IV dilaudid, which is super-duper opiate. And I called in Charlie, bring in the cavalry, here they come. Cavalry, bring in the cavalry. He came in, and sure enough, when it was over, man, I was as physiologically dependent as you can imagine. I wasn't craving the drug. I was just going into withdrawal. They tried to detox me as an outpatient. Didn't work. I take off to Birmingham, Alabama, and I spend 11 days in the detox unit. 
I've had people in AA since that time tell me I need to change my birthday. But you got to remember, AA is not a reservoir of mental health. We have, we not got a prize on the fact that we got a whole bunch of people in here that know the shit about what's going on most of the time. I mean, this is my home, and I'm just as crazy as anybody else. But you give us a good evening day, thank God we're together. When I sent a bunch of the nurses and doctors to AA, they came back after having to attend 10 meetings, and they say, man, y'all seem so normal when you're not together, but y'all get together, y'all crazy as hell, you know. <laughs> and that's exactly what went on. So nevertheless, uh, I went down there and got detoxed. My take-home message is it isn't going to work in us. We're not asking anybody to do anything. I'm not. I had a vasectomy when I'd been home about three months from treatment. They were going to do it under local. This is a funny story. They were going to do it under local. They uh, are going to do it with some sedation. I said, no, don't sedate me. Do it under local. Well, the first time I helped, felt that needle hit my scrotal sack, I thought, bad choice. God, a mighty bad choice. <laughs> Now, it wasn't painful. It was just the idea of what was happening, you understand. His needle, my scrotum. This was not a fair fight, you understand what was going on. So, so I, after they finished, I get up, and I keep fainting because I went into orthostatic collapse. So I, it took me about six hours to get home. So I called my sponsor, and I said, you ought to be proud of me. I said, I told, I told him what happened. I said, but I didn't take any medicine. He said, you're an idiot. <laughs> But no medicine works in me like it does in normal people. That's the way it is. And it's a risk, it's a risk reward. Talk to a lot of people, get doctors involved who know this disease. That's been my experience. Then I started drinking. First four years of my drinking wasn't alcoholic. I got drunk a lot and I drank a lot, but I didn't get up in the morning thinking about drinking. I didn't get in the morning thinking what I was going to do. I just got up in the morning and went to work. Then when I got off in the evening, I had, I drank. And that was for four years. The next three, and the progression was going on. The next three years was pure alcoholic. When I got up in the morning, I knew when my first drink was going to be, it was going to be at 4.30 in the afternoon. I had one of the most successful practices in Louisville. But at 4.30, I walked out of my office. I, saw, I came early and saw the emergencies, saw my patients. My partner then had to stay and see anything that came in after 4.30 because I went over and got my quart of beer, drank it on the way home, got my scotch and water, and got smooth. Y'all remember Smooth? Hell yeah, you remember. That's why you're in this room. That's all you can remember <laughs> is Smooth. You know, the book tells us come a day we won't remember what we will remember. You know, the, the second best thing God ever gave me was the ability to forget. The best thing he ever gave me was you people so I can remember. And when I come in and hear the stories that I've heard, I remember that. But I don't have to sit there with the shame because you've given me a solution to deal with all of that. But you remind me once again of what I am and where I came from and what I got to do not to go back and what I got to do not to go back. The last year my drinking was addictive. It was even more than addictive. It was alcoholic drinking. In 1975, my first wife kicked me out of the house. She should have kicked me out earlier, but she was about as sick as I was. And I, I was, I was. I was honest with her. I did not, as far as just the letter of the law. But man, a lot, I drank a lot of whiskey and finally she kicked me out. We should have never been married. We got married because I was the first person she had sex with and she was the first person I had sex with. We both went and talked to our minister and he said we had to get married. So we did. We hated each other. I mean, we hated each other virtually from day one. We stayed married 17 years and had two children. But I'm telling you, we should have been together about like oil and water. And finally, I drank enough whiskey that she kicked me out, and I was one happy guy walking out that door. <laughs> I got me a white Corvette and a light blue leisure suit. Got in that son of a bitch. Got me some Chevy's Regal Scotch and a sterling silver mint julep cup, and I was the cat's meow. I mean, when I walked in holding that Chevy's Regal Scotch, the party could start. I didn't give a damn whether anybody else was there or not. The party had started because I was there. And that's the way it was. I met Casey after about a year. And I tell you, there are some people here who know my wife. But for those of you who don't, you know she's one of the finest human beings on the face of God's earth. This is one sweet gal. She was taught the big book by one of your speakers here and, and will always be indebted to her for that because she did not get in the book any more than I did when she first came in. 
But nevertheless, Casey was one of the finest human beings I ever met, still is. Her daddy was bipolar, and she watched her mother take care of her daddy. I watched my daddy take care of my mother, and our pathology brought us together. And our hearts have kept us there as we learned this new way of living. But we drank together, drank for drink, for about a year and a half, and then I got sick. Casey's 14 years younger than I am, and she didn't get sick. She's an alcoholic. She came in when I quit drinking, she quit drinking, went to Al-Anon for six years, and then switched to AA when she heard her story to 12-step retreat at St. Simon's. Uh, and she came into AA. I can start that last period of my drinking anywhere in the day. I started at 11 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> Casey and I had one date and moved in with each other. And a uh, pretty typical alcoholic relationship. And then when I got as sick as I did, I would just be sitting in a great big easy chair at 11 in the morning, and I, I don't know if I woke up or, or what happened. I try not to go to sleep because I said, if I don't go to sleep, I won't wake up. If I don't wake up, the day won't start and this misery won't be there. And I thought, oh, my God, if I just not go to sleep. She would come in at night and cry and say, Burns, please come to bed. And I'd say, get away from me. I'm crazy, and I'll make you crazy, too. And she would cry and go off to bed. Then I would get up at 11 in the morning, take a Valium to stop shaking, go out and see my patients. Supposed to be there at 8, get there at 1, two hours of seeing my patients. Then race home and start my, my, my evening. I'd call Casey and she'd have my broil steak and baked potato because I knew I was going to have to save my liver. I knew it was worthless to try to stop drinking, so I'd just try to eat. I'd eat as fast as I could because I'd sit down with my two quarts of scotch whiskey play my first record, which was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the Philadelphia Philharmonic Orchestra, doing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> my eyes have seen the glory of the coming. I'd just cry. I, it's a great song, and I still cry. Then I'd put on my second record, which was Neil Diamond's I Am, I said. My hero was talking to a friggin' chair, for God's sake. Now, Neil had a lot of trouble in the 70s, and one of his greatest songs was that song. I've got an emptiness deep inside, and it won't let me go. I'm not a man who liked to swear, but I never cared for the sound of being alone. That was my lament. That's the alcoholic lament. Alone everywhere. At least this alcoholic. And I would cry. And I would cry. And then I would get in the chair. And she would cry. And that's the way it was. That morning she got up and went to work. And I sat in that chair and I knew it was over. Those of you who have been there know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of you who haven't, I pray that that's what God has in store for you. You get there as quickly as possible. Because I knew it was over. I didn't know what to do about it. I'd had nine years of psychiatric therapy. I'd been deacon in five churches, drinking two quarts of whiskey a night with a woman I adored and adored me and a very successful medical practice, and I had no insides. It was over. I said, God, tell me what to do. And immediately I knew what to do. I walked in the bedroom, got my 12-gauge shotgun, put it in my mouth, and I was going home. I had a deep faith in my God. My God lived on a cloud and looked like Charlton Heston or the Easter Bunny, or the Tooth Fairy, or Santa Claus. And when, but I believed. And I knew when I pulled that trigger. You don't have to believe with that theologically. It's irrelevant. I know what I believe. I was going home. I had a deep faith. Years later, when I found what Wilson said about that, it just I just sat and bawled about this. It's in working with others when he's talking to this guy who apparently is a preacher. And he's really interested in what you can tell him about God, but he's even more interested in why you can stay sober and he can't. And then Wilson says something that just rings to the heart. This man may be an example. He says he may be an example that faith alone is insufficient. Faith alone is insufficient. The televangelists weren't saying that. There'd be mornings I'd get up drunk, turn on the tele television to the televangelist, and argue with them. After I'd get enough whiskey in me, I'd argue with them. But all they would say was, just go in there and pray and you will be cured. 
Well, that's true. But he left out the part about getting on the mule and riding it to the end of the pasture. Faith alone may be insufficient, must be followed by self-sacrifice and unselfish constructive action. Self-sacrifice. I'll tell you what it means to me. Steps one, two, and three. The sacrifice of self. Didn't mean I was going to be a medical missionary in Bolivia. I might have gone there. Didn't mean that I had to go to seminary. I might have gone. What it meant was on a daily basis, where is the power? Right out of the textbook. This isn't original with me. God knows there's very little, if anything, is original with me. Except my insight, acceptance of, and realization of the power within our textbook. And when it became mine, self-sacrifice, one, two, three, and unselfish constructive action, four through twelve. God, the balance in my life is God's power and my work. Say, is my balance, I go to my kids' ball games? Is it that I go to church? Is it that I go to AA? What is the balance in life? The balance in life is real clear to me. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's you. Is the balance between God's power and my work. When I prepared to come down here to give this talk tonight, I sat and I prayed and I went over some of the things I wanted to say. And then when I finished, I thought, God, now I've done my work. You tell me what to spit out. I'm ready to go. People say, do you get nervous when you talk? Not a bit. If I've done my prayer to let me ask for and absorb the power, I'm going to say most of this talk with very few four-letter words, if any. Very little unnecessary humor unless it fits into my experience, strength, and hope because God knows in my best I'm not a good stand-up comic. But it's going to be fine. It's going to reveal my journey in this sobriety. Faith alone is insufficient. I said, God, if you don't want me to pull this trigger, give me a reason. Casey will be better off without me. My patients will be better off without me. My mom and dad will be better off without me. And I got to my children. About 11 and 5. I'd been in practice eight years, and I'd seen a number of people come in impaled on the spear. What had they done wrong that daddy killed himself? Mama killed herself. Whatever. What had they done wrong? Why weren't they loved enough? And I thought, if I pull this trigger, those babies will spend the rest of their life wondering why Daddy left. It was years later when I was really introduced to the profundity of what went on at that moment. Most of that was because I didn't get into the book, as I told you, for ten years. But when I did and had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I was led back to the spiritual experience that happened in that bedroom at that time. I asked my God to give me a reason not to pull that trigger, and he had me think of another human being. What is our primary purpose? You know it. To fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and our fellow man. If you're a member of AA and don't know that, then you're not going to enough meetings and reading enough books. Oh, I shouldn't have talked about you that way. I was that way before I got dumb like you. (laughs) Yeah. Wilson says, those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have eventually recognized the childishness of it. This has been replaced by a great sense of purpose. Our purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum. Not be, fit ourselves to be. I carried a hell of a message for ten years. I was a lethal weapon for God. Take a beer. He's going to drag your ass off to treatment anyway. In Mayfield, I was known as Mr. Dr. AA, and I mean I knew it all. All you had to do was stand still for about 30 seconds, and I would give it to you. Yeah, I wasn't fitting myself. If we ask each morning for the man who still suffers, what we do for the man who still suffers if our own house is in order? On the days that I ain't got it, I'm calling my sponsor. I call him every day anyway, but I call him and say, I ain't got it. Then, Burns, try your best. Just try your best to give somebody a ride, but please don't tell them what to do. Stay sober today. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Come on and sit with me. 
Come on, sit with me. At that moment, the pain that I would cause those kids was more significant to me than the relief of my pain. And that's a first for me. That was an absolute first for me that I would think that much of the pain that I would cause somebody else and would take the pain that I had and ask a power greater than me to restore me to sanity. I didn't say God. God told me about what to do about not pulling the trigger. The next God was a God of, uh, that had skin on him, five, nine, wore glasses and stuttered and was a psychiatrist. I laid that gun down, went to see David the next day. I turned my life and my will over to him and said, please send me somewhere they can teach me not to drink. He sent me to New York City. They detoxed me, shipped me to Atlanta. I spent five months in Atlanta in a treatment center, came home and got into AA in Louisville. It was the best of times for AA in Louisville and the worst of times. The best of times was the fellowship. Dick realizes that because we were right there together. Now, I ran with a different fellowship, but it was still one. Wasn't it wonderful? It wasn't if it's 30 minutes early and 30 minutes late. We literally almost spent 24-7 with each other. Our wives did. We cooked out at each other's homes on weekends. We went to each other's homes at night. We went to McDonald's. We did the whole drill. We were inseparable. There were five of us, and I used to say, if the first one ever stops, we've all got brown noses because we were just right behind each other, just like this. The leader of the pack had three years of sobriety, and we thought he was God. And to us, he did a lot of things that God had him do. A lot of things that I know today that God of my understanding had him do. The fellowship, it's really wonderful that it was wonderful because when I came home, Wilson was the first person to, to talk about what we know today is post-acute withdrawal syndrome. He said for a year and a half he couldn't get a job because he was racked with ways of self-pity and resentment. In 1979, the, the, the post-acute withdrawal syndrome was published. Short-term memory for recent events will be screwed up for six months to two years. Anagrade memory. I couldn't learn new material, or at least I was delayed in learning it. I could still practice medicine because that was like riding a bicycle. I mean, it may scare you to think, my God, I got a man that can't find his car in the parking lot trying to figure out if I've had a heart attack, but you were in good hands. It would have scared the hell out of you when you knew I couldn't, I literally couldn't find my car in a parking lot. And those of you who know me know I used to lose my car next to my office in an eight place parking space. I would go out and, and I remember when I went out one time and came in crying. And I said to my partner, Dave, somebody stole my car. And he went out there and looked and said, Burns, you drove Casey's car. Oh, that's right. I drove Casey's car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to see a psychiatrist. I was doing it all. Go in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'd go in on Tuesday and I'd come in on Thursday. And, and Homer said one day, well, Burns, I want you to start with where we are on Tuesday. This is in the first six months. I said, I don't remember where we were on Tuesday. He said, you're blocking your therapy. And I thought, oh, God, I'm a piece of crap. I'm blocking my therapy. I'm a worthless, no good son of a bitch. That's just all there is to it. You know? So I go into the AA meeting. Not anybody got a problem? I got a problem. What's your problem? I'm blocking my therapy. <laughs> so one of the old timers was very tolerant. And he said, tell me what that means. I said, I couldn't remember where my psychiatrist was on Tuesday. He looked at me and he said, do you remember where his office is? I said, yeah. He said, son, for two years, that's as good as it's going to get. <laughs> <laughs> Saved Save my butt. Second thing, sleep patterns will be screwed up for six months to two years. There's no safe sleeping pill except warm milk and calling your sponsor. That's what I did. My wife would be holding me, and I adored her. Sometimes we would uh, communicate physically, and that would relax me a little while, but then I would still, boom, there I was. I'd go in and call Jim, warm some milk. Thanks, Jim. I'd go in there and warm the milk. Then I'd call him back about 45 minutes later, go warm some more milk. And that's what went on. His voice meant a lot to me. What he didn't know is he was giving me tryptophan through warming that milk. And that's probably one of the best things we have. That's what's in Turkey. If you want to sleep at night and you're a drunk in the early sobriety, just go eat the hell out of turkey. You'll go to sleep a lot quicker than anything else. 
don't worry about all this melatonin and all that other stuff and Lunesta and all that. Oh, you can go ahead and take it. Just get your bed in, in the treatment center. Uh, the melatonin won't, won't put you in a treatment center. It just won't work after about three weeks. The other thing was simple problem solving and stress management. Living skills can be screwed up for six months to four to five years. You know why God gave us sponsors? So we get in the right restroom. <laughs> At least me. So that fellowship was indescribably wonderful because I would go from examining room to examining room and I was on target. In between there, there'd be times I'd just drop down on the floor and start crying. And I didn't know why. I'd go into my inner office, and I'd call, and I'd say, Jim, I'm flying apart. Did you get up on time? Yeah. Did you eat your breakfast? Yeah. Did you do your meditation? Yeah. Are you seeing your patients on time? Yeah. You'll be fine. Thanks, Jim. You come into the meeting night? Yeah. Hang up. About 15, 20 minutes later, Jim, I'm flying apart. Did you get up on time? Yeah. Did you do your meditation? Yeah. Did you eat your... Same song, second verse, five, six, seven times a day. He was absolutely wonderful. When my mama died, she died in 78, and I'd been sober eight months. Mama died a real long death with cancer. And she would go in the hospital that last three or four months virtually every week. And I would drive the 230 or 40 miles down to West Kentucky to see mama. That day she went in on Friday morning. And I called Daddy, and Daddy said, I think it's the same thing. And I said, well, I'll be down in the morning because I'm on call tonight if she looks like well, she normally looks. Well, she died that afternoon. Now, I was in good shape with Mama because Casey and I used to go down every weekend and, and talk to Mama and made the amends, and Mama just adored me, and she knew alcoholism. She was so glad that I had a good woman that I'd quit drinking. I mean, that would meant everything in the world to my mother. So it wasn't any of the shame and all that was there. But I called my sponsor. Jim came out. He's 20 years older than me. He's about 6'4", 5", and he weighed about 2'6". He's a big man. And he came into my little inner office, and they said, Mr. R is here. So I went in with my white coat and my stethoscope on and climbed up in his lap, and he rocked me while I cried. He rocked me while I cried. If time permits, I'll tell you some other things that he did, and they weren't rocking type of stories. But I'll never forget that one. It was not in the textbook. Casey and I, when we got married, I fitted her on my hip, and she basically was my little koopy doll. I mean, everything. I, every time the seasons closed, I sent her a new, new bunch of clothes. Never asked her what type she wanted. Every two years, I bought her a new car. Never asked her what kind of car she wanted. Took her on some of the most incredible vacations you could ever go on. Never asked her where she wanted to go. She was my little koopy doll, and I was Santa Claus. All I had, all I had, all she had to do was just do whatever I wanted her to do. And that wasn't hard, because I really wasn't a, turn, a stern taskmaster. Then she came in AA, had a wonderful sponsor that you would have known her, Bob, and I'll uh, tell you about it later on if it comes up. But Bonnie sponsored her, and Bonnie says, your whole life is Burns. I love Burns. You need a life. What do you want to do? She said, I want to be a therapist. Casey had one year of college. She came and sat down with me and said, what do you think about my going to school? And I said, I think that's a wonderful case. So she goes off to school. It took me about three weeks to come home one night when the house wasn't lit food wasn't there and I was pissed I didn't have a 12 step program so I didn't even know how to call that resentment then I got to thinking this is a good looking young woman she's down there on that campus with all these young studs they're going to take her off to the Holiday Inn Motel or they're going to drag her off in the bushes and rape her so I was eat up with fear with no 12 step program fear Resentment, self-centeredness. My wife is not doing what I want her to do. Now, most people might take a drink, and if I'd have stuck around long enough, I probably would have taken a drink, but I took an easier, softer way. What did I do? I had an affair. I'm not making excuses. The whole program is set up 
to deal with self-centeredness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Fourth step, ten step, eleven step. There it is. I didn't have that program. So I was reacting like a midbrain animal to not being taken care of with all of my fear and my resentment. So I started having an affair with my nurse. Lasted about three months. And I decided I was going to get drunk. I don't I didn't decide I was going to get drunk. I just said, I'm going to get drunk because I'm lying. And if we can't be honest, we're going to get drunk. I hadn't even thought about taking a drink, but obviously I probably did because I said, I'm going to get drunk. So I went and told my sponsor. I'd suggest you tell him first, but I went and told my sponsor. He called my wife and told her. Now, there's a lot of messages in this. I made my sponsor God. Sponsors are not God. We're alcoholics one step away from being drunk. He ran my life. Thank God he ran it. But I, my hook with God was through this man. And probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism eventually. So the fact he told Casey wasn't what happened, the miracle. What happened was I said, God, please help me. I don't know what to do. And one of my sponsees came up with the eight tapes of the two men who traveled this country for 20 years and taught the big book. And as I listened to those tapes, I knew the program I didn't have. I had 11 copies made, and 12 of us sat down and studied. The first time we took our, went through our steps listening to those tapes, and it was the second big book study that was in Louisville at that time. Now there are 40 or 50 going on at all times, and most of them are not just mental masturbation, 12 steps studies. They are there. Even a bad 12-step study, at least in my experience, is better than no 12-step study at all. When I got deeply involved in those 12 steps and knew what I had to have, I made my amends to Casey. I made my amends to Kathy. I made my amends to my sponsor because of the resentment I had because he told my wife. Casey was working at the same time on a parallel strong 12-step program that she had gotten. Anyway, she was there. And we took that 12-step program into therapy for two years. We knew. We didn't know where the bullets were coming from. What we had had was a totally unscarred relationship that, within, that I had almost destroyed within 10 years. And so we went to find out where the bullets were coming from. But the therapist knew going in, and we knew going in, we told him the only solution we know is a 12-step solution. You help us know where the bullets are coming from. Because God, through the 12 steps, will help us reconcile this if we are meant to be together. Our marriage went to places we never imagined. Intimacy, I thought intimacy was a triple gainer from the top of the bedpost on your wife spread out on the bed. I thought that was intimacy. And it wasn't bad when I could do that. (laughs) But the intimacy today is an intimacy that I never knew. I just never knew. The field had been leveled. The amends had been made. The spiritual recovery had occurred. And during that time, we've lived a life that is just like anybody else's life. We're challenged at all times of being irritable, restless, and discontented. We're challenged with the clamors of the, of the world. We're challenged like anybody that breathes and walks on this earth is challenged. We blow it out of proportion, but we've got a program to deal with it. And it's indescribably wonderful. About six years ago, I sat down and I thought, I've known joy. I have known happiness. I wouldn't be anywhere else than where I am, but I don't think I know peace. And I went with my wife to see the psychiatrist, and I said, I don't don't know peace. I don't know what my problem is. He said, Burns, I don't know if anybody's got a better program than you've got. But he said, maybe you just can't step off on shore, because he obviously is in the 12-step program. I said, I guess not. He said, but I don't know what to tell you to do. Just keep doing what you're doing, which is a good advice. But when I got out of there, I thought, I'm going to study. I remember I prayed all night. I talked to two or three long-time people in the program, and nobody came up with anything else. I thought, I'm just going to go back and study the whole history of AA. I'm going to study Bill Wilson's life. Because I knew enough of Bill Wilson to know this was an extremely flawed man, much like 
David, much like Moses, just like all the people that God had picked before, or many of them, flawed people. Their value was in their flawedness. Their value was being flawed. And so I began to study that and Bill Wilson, and I found the answer that met what I needed to find. In 1940, Bill was sleeping in the 24th Street Clubhouse in New York. Bill and Lois, from 1939 to 1941, lived in 52 different places as best we can count. At that time, they lived in the 24th Street Clubhouse. Bill's up there. It's 10 o'clock at night, November, cold. He's in one of his hypochondriacal fits. I mean, Bill was a major hypochondriac because he was an extreme anxiety, irritable, restless, discontented person who was so bright he converted everything into physical symptoms so that they, he just didn't go crazy. And I'm that way, except I've got a medical education, so you can bet what I can do to my mind. I can screw that sucker. And you know, y'all have diarrhea, and you just got diarrhea. Man, I've got worms. I've got ischemic bowel disease. I've got some hoochie-coochie disease that nobody's ever seen. Sutsukamoochie fever. I've got all of them, you know. I should have never gone to medical school. But Bill was, was pretty superficial in his stuff. Thought he had a bleeding ulcer. The fellow coming to see him was named Father Ed Dowling. Ed Dowling was a Jesuit priest in St. Louis. And between 1940 and 1960, Dowling and Wilson were just like that. It had it not been, at least in my opinion, for Dowling and Wilson's life, I'm not sure what would have happened to Bill. I'm sure there would have been a major negative impact in AA because he walked close to the edge most of the time with absolute the best motives and the best intention. But nevertheless, Dowling came to see Bill, and the reason he came is because he had read the big book, looked at those 12 steps, and said, this man who wrote this has reduced all of the St. Ignatian spiritual exercises, which is a very strict type of exercise, He's reduced it to 12 steps. I want to see this miracle. And he comes to see, he comes to see Wilson. It's 10 o'clock at night. The caretaker comes up and says, Bill, there's somebody here to see you. Bill says, Oh God, no, not another drunk. You know, when you're on your third or fourth day of listening to somebody's fifth step and you think, I think I'm going to puke if I have to listen to another day, but we do it because that's what somebody did to us. Bill said, send him up. He can hear Dowling tap. Tapping down the hall, Dowling's five six, pugsy white face, pugs and shocky white hair, about five six. Here's Wilson, six two, six three, six one, bigger man. Dowling comes in, he's got an overcoat on. Bill says, "Take off your coat and let's talk." Dowling took off his coat and Wilson saw his collar. Wilson always had a special affinity for people that were of, that were preachers or priests. I'm sure he thought maybe they had something he didn't have. If you study him and Dowling enough, you're pretty sure that's exactly what he was doing. There's some really interesting things in studying their relationship and the letters they wrote back and forth. Nevertheless, he saw his collar, and he sat down and began to talk to Dowling, and they fell in love with each other that night. And during that four- or five-hour conversation, Dowling says, or Wilson says to Dowling, will I ever know peace? Dowling says, no. He said, why? He said, because you've been blessed with divine dissatisfaction. (laughs) Your seeking will lead so many people home. And for the first time in my life, I knew that what I thought was a handicap was a virtue. Not dissimilar to virtually everything I found in this program. I thought it was a liability. It was an asset. My seeking has not only brought me closer to home, But so many other people have come home because of my seeking. That was my blessing. That was my blessing. I will tell you when I do know peace, peace that far exceeds that first drink when it worked and you could sit there and watch the sunset and remember it was quiet when it worked and there would just be one drink. Maybe you didn't have it like me very long, but there was a week or two when it was that way or a month. For a few years. I tell you when I do know that peace, and if anybody's been in this program long enough and done it, you know it too. It's when I look in the eyes of that person that's in prison and I see their I see their eyes begin to light up. At the homeless shelter, I see their eyes begin to light up. After a meeting at McDonald's, I see their eyes begin to light up. And I know peace. I know peace like I've never known it before or since. And I know today, and this is for me, 
that at that moment when I'm looking in that person's face and seeing that happen, not only am I at peace, I'm looking right directly in the face of God Almighty. Thank you for letting me come. I love you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.